Hello, everyone, and welcome to this panel that we're going to be dedicating today to uh, the European market or the European markets. Uh, this is a panel that uh, me, I thought, would be interesting in order to, uh, well, cover other territories or territories other than the United States. Uh, with me, well, my name is Victoriano Darias, Tano Darias. I'm um, the uh, program director of, of the uh, Mastery Music Business at Universidad Internacional de La Rioja. I'm here joined by, uh, by uh, Stefania Passamonte, Stefania Passamonte from the London Performing Academy of Music. Hello, Stefania, how are you doing? Very good. Hello to everyone. Great, great. I also, we also have uh, Alexander Andres from uh, Pop Academy Baden Württemberg. Alex, how are you doing? I'm doing good. How are you? Um, and hello from Germany. Great. Uh, and uh, someone that you probably already know, because uh, he sits at the board, uh, Henrik Lindström uh, from uh, Linnaeus University from Sweden. How are you, Henrik? Hey, I'm good. How are you? I'm fine. I'm fine. I hope every, everyone is doing well. Uh, to, uh, today we have a um, we ha we're going to be covering a lot of issues, so we have to we have to rush a little bit. Uh, and we're going to be covering uh, different markets. Uh, we have different people from uh, from different European countries: uh, Spain, Sweden, well, UK, Italy, because Stefania lives in the UK, but she's Italian, and mm -hmm. Alex uh, from Germany. Uh, uh, but before we do that, before we do that, I wanted to give you a little bit of a comparison between Europe and the United States. Okay, and a couple of things. A couple of things. Well, um, I'm only I'm going to be talking about Europe, meaning uh, the European Union plus the UK. As you already know, the UK left the European Union. Okay, uh, we see that uh, the land area, well, the, uh, Europe is a uh, smaller territory uh, with bigger with higher population. Uh, the GDP is probably about the same, but due to the fact that the United States has a um, lower population, GDP per capita in the US is higher than in Europe. Again, uh, all the figures that we give about Europe, we have to be taken with a pinch of salt because there are many, many differences between the European markets. Okay, the European markets with a higher GDP per capita than the US and uh, European markets with a much lower GDP per capita. Okay, we take a look at the different sectors. We see that the uh, in sound recordings, the markets are, well, uh, the US, it's, it's a bigger market, not by far. Okay, and the consumption patterns are a little bit different. Okay, uh, streaming uh, is a much more prevalent consumption pattern in the US. But again, in Europe, many, many differences. Nordic countries with a higher penetration of streaming, uh, other European countries with a lower penetration of streaming. Okay, and then we see, and that is quite common, that public performance is more important in Europe. Why? Because the public performance right for, um, uh, for record labels and artists uh, is a much wider right in Europe than, than in the US, where it's only limited, where it's limited to uh, digital audio transmission. In Europe, we can collect uh, record labels and artists can collect from public performance in bars and clubs and radio stations, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Now we, we're seeing that the US leads in, uh, in sound recordings, but when we take a look at publishing, we see that Europe is probably a much more efficient territory uh, in terms of collecting money for the use of musical works, okay, for publishing. Uh, it, uh, it's uh, monopolies in the different countries uh, collect probably twice as much as what is collected in the United States. All right. Again, this has to be taken with a pinch of salt. Why? Because the US, uh, there is more direct licensing of, of publishing rights. Okay. In Europe, pretty much everything, not everything, but again, like 80, 85% probably goes through the, uh, uh, the collecting societies, the mechanical and uh, performing rights organizations that we have in Europe. But we, if we see, if we take a look at the, um, collections per capita, uh, we see that collections per capita of, uh, of publishing rights are much higher in Europe than, than in the US. And this is due probably to the restrictions that the uh, constant decrease in post and BMI and ASCA, which we don't have in, uh, in Europe. Okay. Live music, the US, a bigger market. Okay. But there are a couple of differences. Uh, US performs better in, in touring. Okay, uh, in uh, like individual concerts. Okay, but Europe is actually quite eff efficient in uh, in festivals. Okay, we have some of the biggest festivals in the world, and we, I mean, all of us, Stefania, Alexander, Henrik, and myself, we're going to be talking about different festivals in different territories. Okay, so that much about the comparison between the U.S. and Europe. And now let's take a look a little bit um, at uh, the Europe as a whole. 
okay, in, in different sectors. What we're going to be looking at is that uh, there's always going to be like a, a, the, the uh, top three markets leading any sector of the music industry. And that's always going to be UK, Germany, and France. In some recordings, UK and a little bit after that, Germany lead the market. Okay. Uh, and then there's a big difference. There are um, uh, underperformers like Spain and Italy and overperformers like the Nordic countries and the Netherlands. Okay. And we look, we, we see that when we take a look at the uh, revenue per capita of sound recordings. Okay. We see countries where uh, record labels uh, are able to collect uh, a lot of money from uh, consumers over $20 per capita per year and other countries that um, are a little bit farther away, like Spain, Italy, uh, Eastern European countries, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. We see the same thing about uh, publishing, but there we see that France is very, very efficient. CSM, the French society, is really efficient in collecting uh, money for the use of musical works, then Germany, and then the United Kingdom. Okay. But the Nordic, uh, the Nordic society is also very, very efficient there. You will miss Spain here because the Spanish society was, and these are CSAC numbers, because the Spanish society was expelled from CSAC a couple of years ago. But I'll talk about that in a minute. And then finally, live music, the same thing. Okay, top three markets, Germany. It's probably the biggest live music market in Europe. Okay, uh, then United Kingdom and France. Again, Spain is not there. And I'll, ex I'll explain the reasons when I, when I uh, cover uh, the, um, uh, the Spanish market. Okay, so... Uh, as you can see, many, many differences in consumption patterns, in the, the ability to collect money for, uh, from sound recordings in different countries. Uh, so that, that actually gives us an idea or the idea that Europe is not really um, a market in itself. Okay, There are many, many different markets. They might be national in scope or uh, by, by, um, uh, by languages. Okay, uh, but we have to look into the different markets, and that's what we're going to be doing today. And starting uh, that section of the panel, uh, we're going to have Alexander Andres. Uh, and Alexander, whenever you're ready, uh, Alexander is going to introduce us to the uh, well, probably one of the biggest, well, definitely one of the biggest music markets in Europe, which is Germany. Alexander, the floor is yours. Let me know when you want me to change the uh, the slides. Yes. Can I just uh, break in a little bit? Uh, sure. a little bit uh, could you change the presenter's view uh, to the full view? Because they see your kind of this diapositiva siguiente. I see. Well, okay, so let me... Thank you for letting me know. Let me change that. Yeah. Thank you. And... How about now? Perfect. 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 Very good. Thank okay. you, Tana. Cool. Yeah. Um, Thank yeah, you for letting from, me know. <laughs> yeah. Hello from Germany. And just a, a few data about the German music uh, industry and the uh, music business. Uh, please don't hesitate to contact me if you want to learn more about the German music industry. I have a much uh, larger presentation mm -hmm. for that. So if you are interested to get um, more details and more explanation of how it came to that market, so uh, contact me and uh, we can have a presentation via Zoom or uh, any other uh, platform. So uh, next slide, please. Um, just to give you an um, uh, information about uh, Germany and the size of Germany. Um, uh, as you can see here, Germany is, uh, is, a, is a very small country. I guess it's, it's half, half the, uh, of the size of Texas. I, I don't know exactly, but something around that. Um, uh, Texas is double the size of, of uh, Germany. We only have um, uh, 0.13 square miles uh, within the European Union. Uh, next slide, please. In in terms of uh, capita uh, uh, inhabitants, uh, you see we have uh, 83 million inhabitants in 2020. This is um, quite stable, I would say. Um, and uh, in, if you look back to the to the time before the reunification of uh, Germany, we have 60 million in the western part of uh, Germany and 20 million, something around 20, 25 million in the eastern part of uh, Germany. These uh, came together, as you all know, at the end of the 80s, and the market grows at that time. Very significant, I would say. So next slide, please. So these are the 
the most important uh, cities, I would say, uh, in terms of uh, music industry. Everything is concentrating in Berlin and Hamburg. We have, of course, uh, in Mannheim Pop Academy, my uh, university where I'm teaching. And um, a, a couple of months ago, Sony was located in Munich, but they moved to to Berlin, they still have some departments and divisions in uh, Munich. And as you see here, Mannheim is very close to Heidelberg, which is uh, much more known in the US, for example, and very close to Frankfurt, only uh, 80 to 20 um, uh, miles or something like that. And you can reach easily every uh, bigger city within Germany uh, in, a, in a day trip uh, with a train. So from Mannheim to Hamburg, it's about a five hour trip. Uh, train ride to Berlin is the same. You are in Munich in within three hours and in Paris also in three hours. So it's very close. And in terms of touring, uh, you can imagine that it's very easy to uh, play a lot of gigs within two or three weeks because it's so easy to reach the next city and the next location as well. So the next slide, please. So let's talk about a little bit uh, um, about the German uh, music market. We define our music market as a part of the creative industry. Um, and as you see here, we have different segments. This is uh, a very, um, very recent data um, from, it was published in January, 2021, and it's data from 2020. As you see here, the, of course, the largest the segment is um, uh, live music uh, before Corona, of, of course, but we are very optimistic that it's uh, getting better in next month and uh, we'll, uh, we'll get back to that uh, again and of course um, uh, recorded music and what's also very interesting is we are very strong in uh, instrument market um, we have for example the largest uh, online tailor uh, uh, online um, um, say sales platform in in um, in the world with uh, Toman Music, which is selling instruments all over the world and uh, also have exclusive contracts with uh, different manufacturers. So it's a very strong um, uh, segment as well. So next slide, please. Yeah, let's talk about a bit. Um, oh yeah, this, this, this is, uh, are the numbers comparing to 2014. As you see here, we have a significant growth in Germany in terms of turnover of all companies and cross value added. Uh, this is, uh, I would say tremendous, uh, about 30%. And also the number of employed people in Germany uh, in the creative industry in general, but also in the music industry uh, was uh, uh, growing in the last five years. So let's talk about a bit uh, uh, let's talk a bit about uh, uh, live entertainment. Uh, Tano uh, explained it before or mentioned it before. Um, uh, revenues in live music um, uh, are very high in Germany, but I have to admit that we have a, um, a data problem. Uh, the, re uh, the, the newest data that we have is from 2017. And as you see here, uh, the only uh, basis to compare it is 2013. And uh, you can see all music related uh, on the left side, you see all the music related events that we have. And it was a complete turnover of 3.655 billion uh, euros. And uh, that is also was also growing uh, comparing to 2013. But uh, what's very um, uh, significant is that uh, we don't have a raise of numbers of concerts or raise of numbers of, of visitors. Uh, it all depends on the prices of, uh, per ticket, as you see here on the, on the right column. Uh, the, the, the average price for a ticket is uh, 51.41 uh, euros. And if you compare it to 2013, you had that number 36.35 euros. So we have a, also a tremendous raise of the price of ticketing. So uh, the, the growth of this segment is related to the price of the tickets. So next slide, please. This is... Um, the expectation uh, for uh, 2020, as you see here, before Corona came, uh, every, everyone was was uh, convinced that it will be um, the next 
best year for the life entertainment in Germany. And of course, uh, with uh, within this, the crisis, you see uh, everyone is expecting that it is going on, of course. So it's uh, uh, quite uh, zero right now. And uh, yeah, we will see what happens. Some of the companies have insurances. Uh, they are very lucky. They are um, a public support in this segment, but uh, you will never know what happened after that time. So um, we will see. So next uh, slide, please. Uh, talking about the recording. Uh, oh, no, the, the festivals. We do have a lot of different festivals in Germany, over 1,600 festivals per year, every size, every genre, as you see. We do have uh, brands uh, like Peruca Will uh, or Lollapalooza in Berlin, uh, but we have our um, uh, own festivals were, were founded in Germany and uh, are very successful. For example, Wacken Open Air with uh, 75,000 uh, visitors. It's the largest metal open air that we have in, in, in Europe, I guess in the world, but I'm not quite sure. Um, but we also have uh, hip hop festivals. We have uh, indie rock festivals, electro, indie pop, and stuff like that. So um, if you are a music fan in a, in a, in a uh, particular genre, it's quite easy to have a festival summer in Germany, I would say. So next slide, please. Yeah, some numbers from the recording industry. Um, and uh, um, Tano um, mentioned it before, Germany is, is one of the largest uh, music markets that we have in the world, very close to the UK. Um, but we have a, um, a, a lower development or, uh, in, in, in terms of digital transformation, as you see on the next slide. Um, if you have a look on the formats, digital versus a CD and vinyl. You see that was in the in 2019. We still had 35% of the whole turnover in recording industry was made by physical uh, business models like vinyl and CDs. That had a lot to do with uh, the different target groups that we have, but we also have, still have, a, low, um, a very, very low um, digital transformation. Uh, we still have some spots in Germany where you don't have um, no mobile access to the internet and stuff like that. Um, Germans are very, uh, very uh, traditional and conservative in terms of payment systems and stuff like that. So it's... It, 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 there are uh, different approaches to explain that, but um, Corona speeded it up, as you see in the next uh, on the next slide. So um, these are the numbers uh, of the first half of 2020, and as you see here, uh, everything changed right now. Uh, we have 75 um, percent uh, of the whole turnover was made by the digital business models, as you see. So Germany is uh, uh, getting getting faster right now with the uh, business model. So next slide, please. Uh, one um, very interesting point, if you compare the German music market to the US music market, is that we do have a very, very strong local market and domestic market, as you see here. These are the numbers for the long play productions and the share of long national long play production uh, in from 2010 to 2019. And as you see here, 73.6% of the whole turnover was made by national products. So that has something to do with a particular um, uh, uh, special genres like like German hip hop music, which is very very strong right now, and for the last five years I will say, and um, and we do have a kind of uh, local pop genre called Schlager, which was uh, merged in the last years with uh, pop music and 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 uh, we'll say European dance music and EDM. This this merged, and we had a lot of productions. Uh, in, in terms of this uh, genre. And you can also see that at the single market uh, on the next slide, um, where you have pretty much the same uh, development. So next slide, please. Yeah, it's, it's, it's quite the same. Um, we have uh, in 2019, 64, something around that, uh, percent of all uh, products were a national Production that made it a bit complicated to 
uh, to work on a, in a German market because we have to do uh, uh, artist development and a and r for international products as well as for German products and German development. So that's it from from my side. And uh, would I have over to the, thank to you the very much, Alexander. Yeah, you're welcome. Uh, thank you very much, Alexander. Uh, off. Uh, well, we have now, we have uh, Henrik. Henrik is going to be talking about, uh, well, the Swedish and the Nordic with Scandinavian countries. Henrik, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Um, I will give a short introduction to the Scandinavian countries. I won't be as data-driven uh, uh, as my colleagues here, uh, due to the fact that I know that a lot of you guys, um, as the European liaison, you've heard me speak about Sweden in different uh, aspects and, and cover the data and stuff like that. I will focus a little bit more about the kind of the soft, soft, soft values and trying to explain why uh, why Sweden is the number three exporter of music in the world. Uh, why the Scandinavian countries and the Nordic countries have been fairly successful in comparison to other markets in Europe, uh, and, and also about the pink elephant in the room, which is called streaming. Uh, you can change the slide, please. So when we look at the kind of uh, northern part of Europe, we have countries surrounding the Baltic Sea um, and the Scandinavian peninsula, basically. Um, we use a few different terms to, to describe these countries, the Nordic countries and the Scandinavian countries. Um, not everyone is in agreement, which is included and which is not. But from a kind of geopolitical perspective, uh, the Scandinavian countries are the Scandinavian peninsula, hence Norway, Sweden and Denmark. Uh, the Nordic countries are including Finland and Iceland. Uh, and the Baltic countries would be Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania. Um, from a music industry perspective, the territory, the territory they spoke about uh, back in the days was more or less Sweden, Norway, and Denmark, but would probably today also include Finland or parts of it. Uh, we'll get back to why, uh, and the Baltic states. However, in the same way Europe is not one music industry, Scandinavia isn't either in practice, but rather a handful of quite small domestic markets uh, trying to make our impact in the global music industry. The size of these industries are quite important to remember. While we do have domestic music here, and I kind of feel the same trend as, as Alex is speaking about, where you have a higher penetration of domestic music in, you know, played on radio, uh, especially, um, we're quite small markets. I mean, Sweden is about 10 and a half million inhabitants. Um, Norway, Finland, and Denmark have around 5.56 million inhabitants each. Uh, so the total kind of Scandinavian Nordic market would be around 25, 30 million, which is less than, you know, the state of Texas, I guess. Uh, and also, if you look at Sweden's 10 and a half million inhabitants, that's roughly the same uh, population as London that we will listen to later. Uh, so, but the landmass is quite quite big. You can change the slide, please. Uh, there's some key aspects to remember and consider when we're speaking of this territory. Uh, English is the second language. You study it in school from a very early age. Uh, hence, most of the people in Scandinavia are fairly good at speaking and understanding English. Why is this important? Well, due to the small market sizes, uh, we have to export music to sustain a, a kind of a growth of the industry today. We have to find markets outside our own pond. And since English is in some ways the dominant language in popular music globally, it's quite handy to have a good understanding of English. Uh, and Sweden is fairly good at this exporting thing. Uh, we are number three in the world in net export of music behind the US and the UK. We were early adopters of popular culture in the 50s and 60s. Uh, Post-World Wars, a lot of things changed in the world and Scandinavia, or at least Sweden, imported a lot of popular culture overall. The youth culture in Sweden kind of exploded uh, with a huge influence of Anglo-Saxon popular, uh, popular culture. Not only music, but also movies, fashion, products, and so forth. Why is this important? Well, 
When making music from an Anglo -Sax for an Anglo-Saxon market like the US or the UK, it's good to know something about their popular culture. In a way, you can say we Americanized, not, maybe not to the full extent, but at least somewhat. Uh, there's all, there are also lingual and cultural connections within Scandinavia, uh, especially between Sweden, Norway, and Denmark. Even though it's nowhere near the homogeneous culture, perhaps, we share kind of a Scandinavian language. I can understand Norwegian fairly well, for example, uh, for the most part. Uh, also, parts of Finland speak Swedish, since Finland and Sweden was the same culture uh, a long time ago. So in that sense, the, the market is a little bit bigger for artists singing in their native tongue, especially if you're Swedish or Norwegian. You can kind of uh, see the, the Scandinavian or the Scandinavian market as one bigger domestic market in that sense. We have very strong support systems in place for young people in making music. In Sweden, as an example, we have an extensive system of non-formal education for free that can provide for short courses, but maybe, and perhaps more importantly, rehearsal spaces for free for these kids. Uh, the more people that make music, the higher likelihood we get another Max Martin, The Cardians, Avicii, or Sarah Larson. All education is also publicly funded, so no tuition fees, which is quite handy if you want to study music business with me, for example. Uh, we had fast internet very early and well built. Uh, due to the landmass compared to the US, we are small. I think we can fit a few Sweden in the state of Texas to continue that example. Hence building the internet infrastructure was easier here, but it was also something our governments aimed for. It was a political issue to build the kind of IT infrastructure. So we had both, you know, fast and quick land connections and mobile internet early. Uh, and I don't think we have many blind spots when it comes to mobile coverage in Sweden today. This is important for tech development. And I will get back to that when we're speaking about the pink elephant. Uh, we are also perceived to being technological friendly in a sense. In other words, the overall population are fairly adaptable into new technology um, and innovations. A fun fact is that Sony MediaDisc, as an example, uh, that failed miserably all over the world, kind of worked in Sweden. Not fully, but they still sold units and they still sold albums on MediaDisc. As of now, 98% of the entire population in Sweden over the age of, age of 12 have access to fast internet, either through broadband or fiber or through the cell phone. Change the slide, please. Uh, one aspect that's not mentioned that often is the inventions coming out of this area of the world. We can be quite inventive. We didn't invent the thermometer, but the Celsius guy was Scandinavian. We have dynamite, Alfred Nobel, the Swedish wrench. Computer mouse was a Swedish invention, borrowed by a famous American company. Uh, the ball bearing, pacemaker, Coca-Cola is not Swedish, but the bottle design, the classic bottle design was a Swedish immigrant. The zipper that you use most of you every day is a Swedish invention, Skype. But we also made a few other inventions. If you can change the slide, please, Tom. The Pirate Bay, the lovely Pirate Bay. Pirate Bay was a Swedish invention that had a massive impact on the cultural industries and the music industry uh, globally. We kind of created, created a small problem, but without that, we wouldn't have found a solution. If you want to be a little bit conspiratory, you could say that we created a solution to a problem we also created. Jokingly aside, this inventive spirit is still here. That combined with us being tech friendly and having the infrastructure kind of explain why these music industry companies came out of Scandinavia. Spotify being an example, SoundCloud being partly Swedish, partly German, and Cobalt is a Swedish, uh, Swedish entrepreneur that started. That kind of explains the underlying kind of entrepreneurship driven tech that's coming out of Sweden at the moment. 
at the moment. But I also promised to talk about the pink elephant in the room. Please, Thomas, change the slide. Let's address this. I know I've had hours and hours of discussions about streaming with you the past 10 years when Spotify has tried to conquer the world. Here at MIA, in our Facebook groups, at our summits, and everywhere. 10 years ago, almost everyone outside of Scandinavia seemed to almost despise Spotify and the streaming paradigm. The consumers didn't, but I spoke to a lot of academics and industry that just didn't get it. So here it goes. Why did we adopt into streaming so early in Scandinavia? Spotify was available here in 2008. And when you pressed play, it played. Well, first of all, we had the infrastructure, right? And the population that can be seen as tech friendly. That meant that while some markets, including the US, went into a period of a la carte downloads legally, we were already there. The problem was that that services our consumers used wasn't called Apple Music. It was called Napster, then LimeWire, then DC++, and finally the Pirate Bay. Streaming here did not first and foremost compete with Apple Music. It went heads up with piracy. Yeah, it did compete with CD as well. You see that all, all around the world. The CD is dying. But the CD was already dying in so many ways when Spotify emerged. That is why our industry embraced Spotify from the early days. It was an income. Piracy wasn't. Our industry turns to where there is money. Please change the slide, Donald. And now, well, just a few figures that I promised that I wouldn't show you uh, to end my part of this kind of panel. We've had a continuous growth of the music industry overall uh, for the past 12, 13 years, actually from the time Spotify emerged in the market. So no, Spotify and streaming did not kill the, the music industry here. Uh, rather the opposite. Is it perfect? No. The business models and financial structure we probably need to be tweaked, uh, perhaps going to user-centric, what, what do I know? But from our industry perspective, it was a big thing. It turned the negative trend. Uh, a funny factor, though, we can see in the, uh, in, the, uh, in the figures and in the data today is that vinyl is finally bigger than CD in this market, value-wise which I love because I'm a vinyl junkie. That's all for me. Back to you, Tano. Thank you very much. Uh, very, very interesting market, Sweden, of course. I'm going to be very quick with uh, the description of the Spanish market because I want to leave time for Stefania, who's going to be talking about probably one of the most important markets uh, in Europe. So Spain, I'm going to skip a couple of slides. Uh, well, Spain, a much smaller country and probably not as economically developed as the U.S., uh, also in terms of population, in terms of size. Uh, the sound recording market. The sound recording market, Spain is a little bit of an underperformer, and mostly because the revenue per capita is a little bit over $5 compared to, well, the above $20 of certain Nordic countries, the US, the UK, et cetera, et cetera. Still, we were performing quite okay in public performance. Our collecting societies seem to be working well in that respect. But again, uh, still uh, things that, that we need to evolve a little bit. As regards uh, the type of music that Spaniards have been listening to in the past couple of years, if we take a look at the songs, uh, the top songs, which is probably mostly streaming, and then we will take a look at uh, uh, album consumption, we see that, um, we see that uh, well, two things. First, there's not a lot of um, English-speaking music, at least in the top, um, in, the, in, the, in the charts. Uh, there is some, of course, but I mean, the, the, uh, the leaders here are uh, Latin artists, not even Spanish artists. They're not a lot of, even though you may uh, not fully know the names, uh, the, the, uh, the prevalence here is from Latin artists, from uh, Colombia, from uh, Puerto Rico, mostly reggaeton artists, which is the, the, the equivalent in Spain and Spanish-speaking countries of hip-hop music. Uh, not not quite, but I mean, it, it takes a little bit of the uh, of the place that hip hop hip hop has taken in other countries. Uh, if we take a look at albums, which is a more uh, mature market, we 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 see there that the uh, the Spanish artists, the local artists, have um, a dominance. Okay. Uh, however, the important thing here is that Spaniards uh, love um, music in Spanish uh, from Spain or from Latin America. 
Uh, and also, the, the, uh, in the last couple of years, what has happened is that there's been this um, Latin invasion, if you, if you will. Okay? In the past, it was, more, uh, it was more the other way around. There's been periods where Spanish artists were really, really big. There still are, but they're really, really big in Latin America. Now it's the other way around. Okay? Now the market in Spain is dominated by Latin artists. Okay, uh, English speaking artists, as I was saying, I mean, very popular as well, but I mean, at a second tier. All right. Other interesting, interesting aspects of the Spanish market. Um, a couple of years ago, the local uh, PRO uh, uh, was expelled from um, CSAC, from the International Confederation of Societies of Authors and Composers. That actually uh, opened new business opportunities. Uh, and, uh, well, to compete, to compete with the incumbent. And one of the most important ones uh, was at, uh, a year and a half ago, uh, happened a year and a half ago, when CSAC, the American CSAC, the PRO in the U.S., uh, was really, really interested and was really advanced in opening a subsidiary in Spain. That triggered that uh, the major publishers and the major um, songwriters uh, withdrew their um, repertoire from his guy, from the local society. Why? Because they wanted to entrust that repertoire to the newcomer, uh, which was CSAC. Okay. In the end, um, according to my information, due to pressures from the other European societies, uh, pressures on music publishers, uh, um, the music publishers did not actually take the step to actually withdraw the repertoire and entrust it to CSAC, okay? There are legal disputes uh, still in case because that might have been against antitrust uh, regulations, okay? But I mean, that actually took away a very, very interesting uh, business opportunity that, uh, that had not taken place in any other European country, which is the, the, um, the entrance of a com uh, competitive, um, of a competition um, a competing PRO of the local incumbent, okay? There's been smaller uh, uh, companies uh, trying to compete with the local incumbents, but their market share is really, really low. But this one was a really, really interesting situation that we'll see if, we, if, uh, if it materializes. Then the other important aspect about the Spanish market is live music. Uh, I mentioned before that uh, it is not as developed as other European countries, but there is, there is something particular here. It is not developed because, well, Spain, as you can see geographically, uh, is a little bit at the border of the, the core of where the, the, um, uh, most of the international tours take place, which is Germany, south of, well, the UK, uh, north of uh, uh, France, uh, then probably the Nordic countries. But if you want to play in Spain, you have to make a little bit of a detour. And there are pretty much only two big markets in Spain, which is Madrid and Barcelona. There are other cities, but uh, so Spain is always like the third, uh, Spain and Portugal is like the third uh, markets that uh, international tours uh, um, have in, in Europe. Okay, so and, and some European markets, sorry, some uh, international tours do not stop in, in Spain in, in some years. Okay, also because, well, I mean, it's not, it's not one of the... Uh, uh, richest countries in Europe. It's uh, middle class, all right? However, however, what is really developed in Spain is the live, sorry, the, uh, the festival scene, okay? Spain is probably always in the top three of uh, touristic nations in the world uh, with France and the United States. And part of it um, uh, is due to music tourism, okay? As you can see, a lot of music festivals taking place in the Spanish coast. In Andalusia, in uh, in the in the um, eastern part, Catalonia, close to Barcelona, uh, Valencia, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And if you see at the numbers of those festivals, like the top ones are always over two hundred thousand people, right? And we can compare that to the uh, American uh, top festivals, and it's not too far away for for a small country like Spain compared to the U.S. The uh, the music festival market is quite 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 developed. All right, that brings us to some of the most important brands in terms of music festivals, which are, uh, for example, Primavera Sound, uh, Barcelona Festival, probably Sonar, which is uh, with Tomorrowland, the, the top brand in electronic music festivals. And both have actually uh, exported the brand uh, or have tried to export their brand uh, to other countries. For example, Primavera Sound uh, was going to have its first festival in LA last year, obviously for the reasons that you all know uh, didn't take place. But Sonar, for example, uh, makes editions in uh, different parts of the world, like um, Tokyo, Istanbul, Sao Paulo, okay? One of the top 
uh, brands uh, in uh, uh, in uh, uh, in electronic music festival scene. All right. Finally, one uh, very important brand in uh, uh, of the Spanish music industry is BMAT. BMAT is, uh, if not the top uh, company, one of the top companies in um, music consumption identification, in monitoring. Okay, BMAT uh, uh, provides services to PROs, to collection societies, to record labels, uh, giving them information about how their music is being consumed in online platforms like YouTube, like, uh, uh, well, even Spotify, even though Spotify reports uh, information, but uh, radio stations, traditional and online, okay, one of the top companies. And I think that's pretty much it, what I had to say, because I didn't want to extend myself. So the floor is yours, Stefania. Thank you very much, uh, Tano. Hello, everyone. Um, first of all, London Performing Academy of Music is a classical music conservatory. Uh, but it's a classical music conservatory that is focused on the music business, and in particular, the music business for classical music, jazz, and uh, everything that is not commercial music. Um, but I sit to the committee for the classical record label here in the UK at BPI for the Brits Awards and in the indie labels. So I'm very familiar with all the uh, market. And um, I can say that Germany is huge specifically for classical music market, as is Spain actually, because they have fantastic competitions and conservatories. And Sweden is really pushing forward with those fantastic uh, universities and great conductors coming out of Sweden. Now the UK are uh, in a way, they're a tiny island, they're only uh, 94,000 square miles, but we have a very strong history and uh, both for uh, music and technology. And um, we have a population of 70, uh, 67,000 and more, uh, 67 millions actually, uh, people that are very big uh, fans of music and the music tourism is something that is really important for the UK. UK uh, has a stronger tourism, in particular London, where I am right now. Uh, but though the UK, because we that's what we go, you know, we don't go for the beautiful weather of Spain, for example, or Italy. <laughs> So that's what attracted the tourism. So the music industry is actually uh, very strong, uh, contributed 5.8 billion to the economy in 2019. And uh, the music export grew to 470 million, a rise by 8%. So it keeps rising despite the COVID pandemic. Uh, the label revenue in 2020 raised by 3.8%, reaching 1.8%. 18 billion. So um, the music market in the UK is very strong and the government uh, was very uh, keen in supporting uh, the, the music industry and everything that is related into the music industry. In this slide in particular, um, you can see uh, the numbers from the 2019 um, and that's about uh, the contribution to the um, GBA, the export and employment by given specifically by by the music creators, the live music, the music publishing, the carded music, music representative, and the music retails. As you can see, the music creators um, contributed, uh, they are at the top, they contributed at 2.77 billion, uh, employing up to 142,000 people full time, and the export was at 1.2 billion, so quite huge. And the live music, it was a fantastic 1.3 billion uh, contribution to, to the GVA with um, 86 million in export and 34,000 people employed. Um, now, what happened with the 2020 and the pandemic is that, of course, the live music got a huge <laughs> blow in the face and everything went to, to the streaming and to the uh, stream concert. There was a lot of uh, um, um, shift, a big shift from um, the live performance to the online performance. So we had a one, 193 billions out of streams, out of streams that they were served, uh, you know, with two billion streams, it was a top for the single week for the first time. And the audio streaming counted for over than 80% 
of all the UK music consumption during the uh, 2020, up, 20, up of 22% from the year before. So um, we had almost 14 billion of music video streams, and this accounted for 1.6% uh, of the year end of the album equivalent uh, streaming sale, compared to the 78.9% contribution from the audio streaming. So the pandemic had effect, of course, in the consumption of music, but the, uh, the streaming had a dip just at the beginning. Probably they say, they, they think it might be because people uh, were not commuting anymore or there was more appetite for the news, you know, to try to hope to have the pandemic to go to end before we actually could dream off. <laughs> and, uh, and as... Um, um, Herrick said, actually, the LPs had an incredible 13th consecutive years of growth, with physical being the majority of sales for the number one albums, more than 53% of the uh, chart weeks were um, uh, sold in, uh, in LPs. And funny enough, in the UK, we had the raise of the cassette market. There is a sort of uh, a revival of the cassette uh, um, um, music uh, and that's uh, and in 2020 that the, that was the highest level since the 2003 when the cassette started to enter again the market um, so yeah so about the UK music in the global context um, yes the UK are the music market the largest music market in Europe uh, tell me if you want to go to the next slide um, there is a combination um, of uh, Stefania. We, we're we're a little bit short on time. If if you could go to the main points, that be that'd be great because uh, uh, we we're uh, approaching our uh, closing okay, time. Okay, so and maybe we can talk about the the, the live music. Well. Yes, let's talk then about the live music. So the live music market. Um, the value of the market it was 1.3 billion, as I said before, in 2019, uh, and employs more than 34,000 people, up to 11,000 from the 2018, 11% from the 2018, and the export was uh, in 86 million in 2019. Now, that happened in uh, the problem in uh, the UK wasn't just the pandemic, but also the Brexit, and that's what we want to talk about. We have uh, um, a music tourism that is a big part of um, uh, the UK market. Uh, there was 4.5 billion spent in the UK in 2019, and the festival attendance was uh, a 6% higher in 2019 with 5.2 million of uh, people, 4.9 million uh, uh, compared to the 4.9 million in 2018. Uh, Glansbury is one of the uh, most famous festivals one of the largest and um, you know you have uh, basically all the UK they have incredible uh, uh, cities and regions with uh, both uh, fantastic venues London got the O2 who was again nominated the uh, the biggest venue in the world. Royal Albert Hall is huge, not just for classical music, but for uh, um, other uh, uh, germs as well. We have Wembley Arena. So London is, what is the biggest center uh, for music tourism and uh, live music for touring. But then you got uh, uh, Manchester, uh, Liverpool, Birmingham uh, with the historical bands as well. So there is also a a fans touring to look for the Beatles, uh, for um, all the great, uh, the Queens and, you know, all the great bands that they are part of the UK heritage in music. Um, so with the Brexit, apart from the pandemic, the Brexit definitely uh, brought uh, some questions and we're still working on it uh, in terms of uh, touring visa for artists coming into the UK and vice versa, UK artists uh, going abroad for uh, concerts and touring. And as well, there is, of course, the problem with the record label in uh, uh, distributing uh, CDs. There is huge blocks uh, um, 
um, given by the import-export duty. Uh, there is confusion above all in the legislation. That's the major problem. And, uh, and so we've been campaigning a lot with BPI, PRS as well, um, with the government lobbying, you know, to try to find a solution with Europe. But that's definitely something that, um, you know, when Brexit happened, just like the day before we had a big uh, meeting at BPI where we were talking about technology and the fact that technology and the virtual reality uh, was bringing us all together, was breaking the barriers between uh, uh, countries and markets and brand, uh, really bringing everyone towards globalization. And with the same spirit, my conservatoire, the London Performing Academy of Music, has developed an incredible new platform for online teaching where we will be be able to have professors from all around the world teaching students as if they were in person with acoustic um, acoustic quality and stereo and bidirectional. So technology starting from Sweden with the streaming and Spotify and of course America um, and all the other countries has stepped in during the pandemic and is a huge, huge help as well with Brexit to um, allow students to come to study in the UK, for example, in my conservatories without the need to pay international fees because they will be studying a mix between online and then coming physical to do orchestra and opera, etc. cetera. Um, so that's my view on the UK market and uh, the relationship with Brexit pandemic and the future really. Was I fast enough? <laughs> Sorry, Tano. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, uh, guys. Um, unfortunately, well, uh, we 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 had to rush. We we all wanted to give a lot of, a lot of information. Uh, we also wanted to give the floor to the audience to make questions, but uh, I don't think we have the time. Do we, Henrik? We do not. I think we, we have should. Uh, here, but we can share our email addresses in the chat uh, and uh, or our exactly. Mail. And then you can contact us if you want to discuss further. And also the cliffhanger of having a panel about Europe and Brexit next time, perhaps. Yes. I don't know. <laughs> I'm just putting it out there. <laughs> exactly. I think it's a great idea. And we can also share our presentation with uh, those of you who are interested. Okay. So what we're going to do is to uh, well write our email addresses here, uh, the four of us. And on my behalf, I would like to thank uh, Mia, of course, for giving us the opportunity and uh, the panelists that have joined me here, uh, Stefania, Henrik, Alexander, and uh, well, myself, Tano, uh, that we have been uh, honored to be speaking to you about the European market. And hopefully in coming sessions of the uh, summit, we will be able to talk about other markets uh, and uh, not only in Europe, but in other countries of the world. Okay. Thank you very much. And uh, I hope you enjoyed the rest of the summit. Thank you.